Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Straight Up Texas podcast presented by Whataburger, the official podcast of the Texas Rangers and a celebration of the Texas spirit uh, that we see uh, in the Rangers and everywhere around us, including our friends at Whataburger. Uh, You need to say hello to the freshness and the deliciousness of the Pico de Gallo burger, two all beef patties, pepper jack cheese, creamy cilantro lime sauce, and crisp Pico de Gallo, just what your taste buds were waiting for. I've had it. It's awesome. You should try it too. Don't wait though. It's available for a limited time. You've got the burger. You can also get the Pico de Gallo chicken sandwich if you'd like. I encourage you to go and check that out at your local Whataburger. Uh, I'm Jared Sandler. Uh, thanking you for being with us. Joined as always by JB Sauceda, the founder of Texas Humor. And later, we're going to be joined by a special guest uh, who is very, very much straight up Texas and who he is and what he does. I'm excited uh, to chat with Travis Heim of Heim Barbecue. Uh, he'll be coming up in a little bit. And for those of y'all that this is your first time listening, so what is the Straight Up Texas podcast? Well, it's the official podcast of the Texas Rangers. And, you know, we won't be deep diving into uh, the Rangers in baseball. Um, this podcast is really about a celebration of Texas and its spirit and, you know, the uh, resiliency of all of the people that live here and, and the things that make this state such a great place. Yeah. And, you know, we see this in the in the Rangers. You know, it's a part of the culture. It's something that Chris Woodward is, is preaching Regardless of the outcome, this is a young team. They're persevering through this this process in which they're trying to get back uh, to being World Series contenders. You know, Jay used the word resilient and and proud. Uh, It's not easy to to look at the standings and see where the Rangers are and have that pride. But we see this and we hear this from a lot of the young players who uh, have taken a lot of ownership in this organization and getting this organization back. Uh, to where it belongs. So we're going to kick off each episode talking about the Rangers. Like Jay mentioned, we're not going to go into WOBA. We're not going to talk about FIP or any of these advanced metrics. This is just going to be, you know, a a general conversation about the Rangers, where they are, maybe what's coming up. Uh, But the main part is going to be our conversation uh, that Jay and I will have with a special Texas celebrity guest. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, Travis Heim is our guest. Uh, we had a chance to chat with Travis uh, a few days ago, and we're excited to bring you that conversation. And, and how about that, Jay? Travis, uh, what, a, what an awesome dude. I really enjoyed that conversation. I almost enjoyed it as much as I enjoy Heim Barbecue. Not quite as much because Heim Barbecue is, is pretty awesome, but it was really awesome t- uh, chatting with Travis. Yeah, I love hearing from small business owners. I mean, it, it's it's really fun, especially, you know, folks in the restaurant business. Uh, you know, they've had a really, really tough year. So talk about resiliency. I mean, Travis and his businesses uh, have just done incredibly well uh, and have been resilient. And uh, getting to hear him talk about that was a lot of fun. But, uh, you know, before we do uh, d- dive into the interview with Travis, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about the Rangers. So uh, the Rangers have three players in the All-Star game. And what, what, how do you feel about that? Do you think we should have uh, more than that, fewer than that? What, what's the, the Jared Sandler take? Yeah, I, I thought I think three is really appropriate. And it's it's tough sometimes when you look at the Rangers record uh, to get three All-Stars. You know, sometimes there is a bias towards teams that maybe are leading their division. And, and I'm just really glad that the Rangers got the three. They got Joey Gallo, Adolis Garcia and Kyle Gibson, because to me, if you this is the test, if you took away names and teams and it was player A and his stats, player B, his stats, all the way, you know, all the American League players grouped by position and you didn't know name, you didn't know team, those three players would unequivocally be chosen as all-stars. And I'm glad that they got in, you know, for all three of them, uh, there's, you know, a unique wrinkle to it. For Adolis Garcia, this is a guy that uh, five months and four days ago was designated for assignment, which means that uh, the Rangers were willing to expose him to the 29 other teams, all 29 other teams had a chance to claim him. They passed. Uh, Adolis Garcia didn't make the opening day roster. Uh, This is a guy who came over from Cuba. Uh, You know, it's been detailed time and time again, the struggles that just Cubans in general have, but especially the the baseball players who defect. And, you know, sometimes it's third, fourth, fifth try where they actually successfully defect. Uh, And Adolis Garcia's journey is quite fascinating. And the story just within this year of, didn't make an opening day roster. And now here he is uh, an all-star for the American league. Really, really neat. And also a great sign for the Rangers moving forward 
Uh, we might be able to talk about that in a little bit. Kyle Gibson's a guy who's been around the block. You know, he's uh, this is a, a wily veteran who, you know, perhaps it, going into this year, maybe if you asked him with some truth serum, hey, Kyle, will you ever be an all-star? He might say, yeah, I'd be cool, but, uh, you know, I don't know. He's coming off the worst year of his career. He's coming off two straight years in which he has dealt with the challenges of ulcerative colitis. Yet here he is, one of the best pitchers in the American League. And Shohei Otani is going to start the All-Star game. You know, as we're having this conversation, the All-Star game has not taken place. Uh, so, you know, that's an honor to, to start it. And, and Shohei Otani, uh, for what he means for the sport of baseball, tip of the cap to Shohei and, and, and receiving that honor. But it's really neat that you could have made a really strong case for Kyle Gibson to start the all-star game. That's a, an indication of just how good this guy's been. And uh, what also is really special is the, the feedback that I received. And I know so many others received from people attached to the twins organization, expressing their uh, elation uh, and, and Kyle Gibson making the all-star team, because this is a guy who, leaves his footprint not just on the mound but in the clubhouse and in the community a, a really special individual and it's it's always obviously easier to root for those types of guys and then Joey Gallo this is his second time but I think because Joey got off to what was perceived as a slow start for him to come from behind if you will and get all-star recognition is an indication of the respect that people have for his game as a whole you know, a lot of times, if you have a good first two months, you might cement yourself as an all-star because in people's minds, you're in that conversation. It's a lot tougher to have a great June and make the all-star team than it is to say have a great May. But I think people are so alert and aware of Joey Gallo now. He is such a household name that it doesn't take a lot of effort for people to take notice when Joey goes on a tear like he did in June. And you know, we're not going to go into, you know, these deep numbers, but uh, suffice to say that if you get into those numbers on your own, you go to websites like fan graphs or baseball reference, it'd be really tough to identify maybe five or six better outfielders in all of baseball this year. When you consider the total package of what you do in the batter's box, what you offer defensively and what you do on the bases. And uh, so really cool for all three of those guys. And it's just always great, you know, as a fan, the Rangers aren't going to make the playoffs this year, but to have such a big national spotlight event like the all-star game, to be able to say, Hey, those, those are our guys, you know, they're, they're representing my favorite team. I remember as a kid growing up, that was always really cool. And I'm sure it'll be really cool for some young Rangers fans who get a chance to watch these guys, at the all-star game. Speaking of uh, youth, uh, the Rangers picked up Jack Leiter in the uh, draft uh, second pick. So what's your take on, on him joining the team now? Yeah, that, what, what an exciting addition for the Rangers. You know, I, I think it was assumed that with the second overall pick in the draft, you were going to be excited about the player the Rangers selected. I think what's maybe a little extra exciting about Jack Leiter is it seems that most of the fan base was more fired up to draft him than anyone else, any of the other options. Now, that doesn't mean that, uh, you know, the it's going to be the best pick or, or not or whatever, but there's definite excitement here. And I think it's, it's tough to argue with the pick. He's the guy that I've wanted for the last six months. So I'm maybe biased in this assessment, but I'm pretty fired up. Uh, he went to Vanderbilt, which is a, an SEC school. And that's significant because the SEC has been the best baseball conference, much like football here for a few years. And the level of competition in the SEC is above and beyond the rest of college baseball. Not that the other conferences uh, don't, you know, compete at a high level, but for a pitcher like Jack Leiter to have the success that he's had at the SEC within the SEC is really telling. And it's not just success, it's dominance. If you look at his numbers, the way he's operated, uh, and this is also the son of a near 20-year major leaguer, the nephew of a major leaguer, the cousin of a major leaguer. This is a baseball family, and I think that, Baseball is something that he thinks, uh, you know, it's not just the, the physical talent. I think he, he's got a high baseball IQ. And then the one thing for fans that really stand that stands out to me about Jack Leiter is his success within the strike zone. And it's not just about throwing strikes. You know, a lot of these guys can throw strikes, 
but not a lot of guys can have success or dominate in the zone. They rely on getting people to swing at their pitches outside of the zone or simply getting weak contact around the perimeter of the zone, those 50-50 calls. And not that Jack Leiter wants to live over the middle of the plate or make habit of that, but his stuff is so good that he is not just good but dominant when he throws pitches inside the strike zone, specifically his fastball. Fastballs inside the strike zone for the best hitters in baseball typically go a long, long way. Uh, but for Jack Leiter, he's got the characteristics with that particular pitch that make it a, a super effective pitch. And that's what uh, I think I and, and many others really like about Jack Leiter. Excited for the Rangers to officially sign him, get him into the, the system, have him start, you know, wherever it is that he starts in the minor leagues and, and follow his journey to the big leagues. Uh, and hopefully someone who will be a Ranger for a long time. That's awesome. Well, you know, speaking of just a uh, long time, you know, baseball seasons can uh, can feel kind of long uh, and we're, we're at the halfway point. So what are you looking forward to in the, the second half of the season? Yeah, I'll give you three things. Uh, the first thing is the trade deadline. That's the next big event. Uh, and it's typically July 31st. I believe this year it's July 30th because the 31st falls on a weekend in Major League Baseball didn't want the awkwardness of teams that have day games with the usually what three o'clock Metroplex time, three o'clock central time trade deadline, having to not play a guy and uh, maybe take a guy. They, they, they won all night games. Right. And that makes sense. So it's going to be July 30th. And for the, you know, the trade deadline presents an opportunity for a lot of the teams. I'd say that, you know, they're typically going to be maybe a handful or so teams who they're not really buyers. They're also not going to really be sellers in a big way. So, it just kind of is what it is. It's a it's an exciting, action-packed day for baseball, but not maybe for that particular team. But uh, the Rangers have an opportunity to be heavily involved in the trade deadline. And they're going to have some really interesting and tough decisions to make with guys like Joey Gallo and Adolis Garcia and Kyle Gibson. They're three all-stars, guys like Ian Kennedy. And then there are always some players, maybe a Jordan Lyles or a Mike fulton you know, guys who've pitched well of late. Uh, maybe not going to bring back big hauls, but guys who you could see some movement from. Uh, and, you know, the decisions are, are this, you know, because I, I know that, listen, Joey Gallo, why the heck would you trade Joey Gallo? And maybe the Rangers do, maybe they don't. You know, it would be awesome if the Rangers could sign Joey Gallo to an extension and keep him in a Rangers uniform for a long time. And that's a possibility. But the trade deadline uh, presents some tough decisions for organizations to make a, de a determination you know, is the, the trade package that fill in the blank team is offering us worth more to us for the next four to five years than keeping this player around and signing him to an extension. And the reason why Joey Gallo's name is mentioned is because he's a free agent after not this season, but next season. And what no team ever wants is for a player as good as Joey Gallo to leave them in free agency. And all you get in return is a compensatory pick, which could turn into a really good player. But typically, the player who leaves you in free agency is going to give you more value than that compensatory pick as a player for you or what he can bring back in return could be of greater value. So it's going to be a really interesting and exciting, perhaps a pivotal stretch for the Rangers. Beyond the trade deadline, I'm excited to see Joey Gallo and Adolis Garcia. I hope that they're Rangers after the trade deadline. And I'd love to see what the year looks like for them because, Jay, as you mentioned, uh, it is a long season, and a lot can change over the final two and a half months of the season. Is Joey Gallo still among the, the five to seven best outfielders in, in the American League in baseball when the season ends? Uh, Adolis Garcia, is he able to keep up this pace? And just generally speaking, I think it's always fun as a fan to identify a guy or two that you're just excited to watch play because they do special things that most players don't or can't do. And Adolis Garcia and Joey Gallo, uh, are two of those guys, maybe the, the, the guys who uh, more than anyone else with the Rangers represent that. And then the final thing is the young guys, the guys who aren't Rangers right now, the guys who uh, could be Rangers for the next several years that are in the minor league system, guys like Curtis Terry, a guy like Leody Tavares, who started the season with the Rangers, but had a rough start, but has been really good in AAA and will undoubtedly get another opportunity. Sam Huff is another guy. And then perhaps some of the pitchers, uh, who the Rangers have coming up through their system, just following the young guys and watching Josh Young. How can I not mention Josh Young as well? The Texas Tech product out of, out of the San Antonio area. 
who was their first round pick two years ago. You know, watching these guys perhaps get an opportunity at the big league level will be a lot of fun for, for fans and something we'll probably see, if not from all of those guys, certainly some of those guys over the next two and a half months. And I, uh, I love your energy for baseball and, uh, you know, the, the, the depth, I mean, it, you, uh, you, you'd be high on my draft pick of, uh, <laughs> on, my, on my draft list for uh, who's going to play baseball trivia with me. Um, so, dude, uh, you know, now we're, we're going to move on to talking to Travis. We, we, we checked the box around the resiliency of the Rangers and just the passion and optimism of the team. Um, so uh, what do you say we go ahead and shift over and uh, talk to Travis about baseball or about a uh, barbecue, rather? Well, let's do it. First, though, that's why we make such a great tag team, because you got the Texas side. You love baseball, but you just own Texas. I love Texas, but baseball's my thing. I mean, we just it's, you know, yin, yin and yang. We, what's uh, salt and pepper? I don't know. Whatever. Yeah, I mean, whatever everybody can agree that barbecue is delicious. So uh, yes. whether you love or hate Texas or love or hate baseball, uh, barbecue brings people together. So no uh, kidding. Yeah. And before we talk to Travis, just a reminder, I want to thank our friends at Whataburger. This, of course, is the Straight Up Texas podcast presented by Whataburger. You've got to go to Whataburger and check out the Pico de Gallo burger. It's available for a limited time. I had it the other day. I love Pico de Gallo and I love burgers, so it was a really easy decision for me. But you've got the two fresh beef patties, 100% fresh beef, the slices of pepper jack cheese, the creamy cilantro lime sauce. It brings it all together. So head on over to Whataburger. Again, it's available for a limited time. The Pico de Gallo burger. You can also get the Pico de Gallo chicken sandwich. If that's more of your thing. But we got to talk barbecue, as Jay mentioned. Travis Heim, the founder, the owner of Heim Barbecue, pitmaster extraordinaire. Our conversation with Travis coming up. All right, joining us now on the Straight of Texas podcast presented by Whataburger is a friend of mine. And uh, in spite of our friendship, he's doing great things. He's the founder and pit master of Heim Barbecue. Uh, you might be familiar with the locations in Fort Worth. There are two of them. Uh, there's also a location in Dallas right next to Love Field, which I love because it's uh, a little bit closer for me. So whether you're in Dallas or Fort Worth, uh, you can enjoy Heim Barbecue. Uh, he's also a podcaster, and we're going to get into that as well in a little bit, but uh, joining us now is Travis Heim. Travis, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks for having me, guys. I'm excited. So we're going to get into your story. I know that a big part of your story is Texas and, and your time spent in Texas and obviously now, you know, really carving out your your own place in Texas from a, a you know, a barbecue standpoint, which is no small feat. But you know, we call this the Straight Up Texas podcast. Uh, I'm curious, when you just hear the phrase Straight Up Texas, what jumps to mind for you? <laughs> Great question. Straight Up Texas. Um, I, I'm thinking uh, boots. I'm thinking cowboy hats. I'm thinking longhorn cattle. Uh, football. Uh, baseball, obviously. I think uh, it's a great name. It's a great name for what y'all are doing, but um yeah i don't know it's it's there's a there's a clear connection with barbecue and and native texans it's in our bones you know almost to some extent so uh, uh i guess that's that makes sense to have me on in that regard maybe well, barbecue is <laughs> such a big part of texas uh and we'll get into that i i gotta ask you though this uh this podcast is presented by whataburger you just took a, a sip out of a whataburger cup uh, I know that you, there you go. I got, I got mine too. I got to probably show the logo, right? <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Jay, Jay, Jay's got oh, the nice. spicy shirt. What's your, uh, what's your go-to Whataburger order? Oh man. Um, well, for one, I've been on a diet lately, which is just a, a nightmare, but, uh, I would say go to, and then I'm probably gonna have to get this later. I like, I like the number two with cheese, right? Simple. But uh, grilled onions, grilled jalapenos, and a large fry. Like if you could get a bucket of fries, I would buy a bucket of fries from them. You know, but yeah. <laughs> Dude, a bucket of fries, a bucket of fries. I mean, I feel like their large is kind of like a bucket almost. I mean, it's that yeah. like tr tr like vertical trough of, uh, of fries. <laughs> yeah. Uh, are you a spicy or a uh, regular ketchup guy? I mean, both have their merits, you know, I'd say, uh, I, I, I like the spicy, um, spicy's good. Sometimes you need that a little bit, you know, and then they have the, uh, 
what's the pepper sauce or whatever you know that now we're talking fringe menu options but uh it's all good i'm a big fan so <laughs> fair enough so uh you know i I've got to go somewhere that's, you know, a little bit uh, divisive um, as, as, you know, someone who's obviously steeped their career in, in barbecue in general, you know, I, I bought one of these, uh, uh, what do they call it? Uh, Traeger grills uh, sure. like a year ago. And some of my, you know, barbecue brethren have been giving me a hard time about it. Um, but they're <laughs> the same people who turn around and like, you know, sp you know, speak all day about their uh, big green egg. So like, you know, as a barbecue expert, can you walk us through your thinking around the, uh, the scientific advances in barbecue that are taking place today? Great question. Um, I feel like I guess I feel like personally your uh, smoker shouldn't have an electric plug. Maybe that's just me being a, a purist, but um, we do a lot of uh, barbecue classes and uh, we just did some this weekend. And uh, you, you see a mix of the pellet smokers and Traeger's a good brand and then there's a bunch of others, but um, green eggs kind of offset smokers, more traditional stuff. And I think, you know, they're all great. Like if, if anything, the cool thing with uh, pellet smokers is it's, I, I feel like it's kind of made barbecue more accessible to a lot of people where, um, you know, let's say even five years ago or something, there was a, you, you, you almost had to like build your own smoker. You know, there was some options on, on the kind of commercial market, but you couldn't really get, um, you know, something like that, that's just super easy. And then too, it's like a lot of guys and, and ladies don't have 16 hours to like be tied to a smoker and cook a brisket or whatever. So, um, I, I, you know, I joke about it a little bit, but I think if anything, it's cool that, you know, you can, you can con control all those things with the pellet smokers. And, you know, there's a little bit of a difference. Like when we do the classes, we talk about, you know, just different, points of contact from from the heat and your smoke level your humidity level all of that stuff but at the end of the day if you can cook a really good brisket and you know an offset smoker or cook it on a pellet grill that's all that matters you get into two there's a there's a bunch of like you know the it's uh i don't even know how to describe it's like your favorite baseball team you know it's your, like what church you go to it's like these guys are like you have all these rules of unwritten rules of barbecue and you know, God forbid someone wants, you know, like God forbid someone wants to see their family while they're cooking a brisket, you know, it's like, it, it gives you a little, little more freedom, I guess, with, uh, with some of that stuff. So I, I think they're fine. Don't let anyone bully you. No, I mean, my, my wife did give me a hard time because I've got one of these like huge, uh, you know, like uh, batteries that you can use like when you're camping or whatever. And last week I was making a rack of ribs and I had it on the trigger and she's like, is your barbecue smoker running off of a battery pack right now? You know? And so even she was giving me a hard time, but you know, I, I I'm with you on that. Like I, there is nothing more fun to me than sitting around all night, uh, you know, at a camp or at a uh, like cook off watching the brisket, staying up all night, you know, all that. So, you know, tell me like, I mean, for me, that that's the, the, the thing that got me into brisket and cooking and stuff was really just that experience of being like wrapped up in something for 16 hours. But like what, what ultimately got you into barbecue, you know, uh, as a whole? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, if, if anything, it was really family initially for me. Cause too, like I, the first brisket I cooked, I was 12. And so this is like, you know, barbecues like cool now or whatever. Like I was like the nerdy kid that was cooking barbecue, you know, years ago, whereas like other kids were, you know, doing fun things. But um, a big part of it was my, yeah, a big part of it was uh, my grandfather who's from Hereford, Texas, uh, up in the panhandle, if you're familiar with that. And uh, he would cook a lot at the house and, uh, or, you know, at his house and do ribs and stuff. And then my, um, uncle was from Marshall, Texas in East Texas. And he was a welder. And so he actually in like the sixties and seventies would weld smokers, um, you know, way before all of the stuff that's going on now. And so he had some kind of really cool giant custom, you know, smoker stuff. So it was always kind of, I was like around it, you know, nobody in my family did worked in restaurants or did anything professionally, but 
um i i would say if anything it was just kind of like to emulate my grandfather and like you know in hindsight maybe like he'll think i'm cool if i do these you know cook some ribs and stuff and then i got uh you know the bug or whatever and and what i really enjoyed as i as i got older and into high school college and everything was just the like science behind it you know i mean you're really getting down to you know controlling your temperature you know especially if you're using a wood fire um in an offset or something like that so it's like you know you spend like you said all night cooking something and then if it turns out great it's just elation and you're like <laughs> i've never been happier and if it turns out you know bad it's like you know missing the playoffs last game of the season you're just absolutely heartbroken and and devastated and then all you can think about is the next cook that i'm going to do and how i'm going to change you know and do something different so there's a there's a lot of challenge uh to it and even every day for us in the restaurants we're trying to control all the different variables and, and be as consistent as possible so you know it's still fun that's the part of it i enjoy so you mentioned the restaurant. I, I'm curious what the origin story is of Heim because that's to, to go off on your own to do your own thing. There's a, a degree of perseverance and, and, and fearlessness. And those are some of the, the qualities I know we associate with being straight up Texas. So what's the what's the Heim barbecue origin story? Yeah. Uh, it, how can I summarize? Um, I, you know, kind of what we were saying, I, I grew up cooking barbecue and that was just sort of fun, you know, and then in college we'd save enough money, me and my roommates for a 30 pack of beer and a rack of ribs or a brisket or something like that. And so I kind of continually, you know, was still screwing around with it and didn't really do anything professionally and worked at some restaurants um, here in Fort Worth and then at, at some places in Austin and just kind of, you know, whatever, didn't know what to do. I want to do barbecue full time, but you know, this is to like eight years ago, nine years ago. Um, so the thing that really changed everything, I got a smoker uh, from my uncle who in Marshall, Texas, who I was telling you about. And uh, you know, it's just this giant, like we had a 99 Honda Civic two door, like it couldn't pull a lawnmower, you know, and we're like, I'm asking him, Hey, can I have this, you know, one ton uh, smoker and so uh i was like i'll give you all the money i have and he was just like come pick it up so um we drug it out of the mud on the farm in marshall texas with the u-haul truck brought it back to fort worth and uh i had no idea how to use it or what to do <laughs> and uh we just kind of played around with it and so i realized very quickly like i burned you know about a quarter quart of wood just to cook like one brisket on it. So it was like, this isn't practical at all. And um, we got this idea to do like parties. And I guess now you would call it a pop-up, but uh, we called it T&E. My wife's name is Emma, T&E Meat Club. And uh, it was like a fight club, right? Like an underground, you know, you had to know somebody <laughs> you had to, to, get, uh, to get invited get or whatever. Yeah, 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 exactly. And uh, we'd have a friend that would just be playing, you know, guitar and cold beer and whatever. And then I'd cook stuff and try different recipes. And so it was about a, a 500 gallon propane tank. So, I mean, it's a big, really big smoker. So we did that. And then it, it you know, that just got kind of crazy. And we had like 80 people in a 2000 square foot house. And, you know, it was like, this is, this is just craziness. And, my friend Hans at Swiss pastry shop in Fort Worth, he let us do one at his restaurant. And we're kind of thinking about moving to Austin, working for some friends and all this. I was in the oil and gas industry and I got laid off because um, my project was over. And it was really more than anything, my wife that was like, let's just go for it. You know, let's try to try to do something. And I had been working in Austin and driving back uh, and, and Monday, so I drove back Sunday night. Monday morning, I was looking up uh, used propane tanks on Craigslist so that I could build another smoker because we needed more capacity for our, our pop-up dinners. And I found uh, a food truck that was for lease in uh, near south side of Fort Worth. And it just kind of all clicked. And so I, I talked to the guy and 
we basically pulled our smoker up behind it and opened up and um, that we spent basically all of the money we had on the deposit uh, which luckily the owner didn't know at the time, but then the uh, the rest of the money on meat for the first day. So literally when we opened the doors the first day, we had like less than $100 in our bank account. And uh, I like to say it was an act of faith. You know, I don't know if that's straight up uh, Texas necessarily. It's more probably foolishness, but uh, in our <laughs> case, you know, in our case, it worked out. So well, I'm curious, what was... And obviously there are a lot of challenges and you identified some of those challenges. Was there a moment where you and Emma were like, this is just not going to work. We got to figure out a way to, to overcome this. And then on the other hand, was there a moment when you're like, all right, we're, we're clear. Like this is working. We we've got this thing rolling. Yeah, I think, um, you know, we, we were just very blessed to never really experience, um, any kind of failure with that so far the the biggest thing was like i remember there was a time where we had the weekends and then um you know we're cooking as much as we can i would sleep in the bar usually when the bar would close i would sleep in there or i would sleep in our at this point we upgraded to a minivan uh you know that was had 500,000 miles or whatever and so i would sleep in the minivan or at the bar working 24 hours emma would be basically as soon as we were done would leave and then go home and then make banana pudding, potato salad, everything for the next day. And so we were just like zombies and we had a couple of caterings that um, were great, but it was just feeling of it. I, I think it was, it was at least 36 hours without sleep for both of us just working. And it was awesome, but it was kind of like, we need to, we got to figure this out. <laughs> like We can't, we can't do this, uh, do this forever. And so uh, then we hired our first employee. So that was great. Um, so then at least we had one per one, yeah, one person to kind of help out and uh, get a, a little bit of sleep here or there uh, in the food truck. But I think the, the big, the big moment where at least we felt comfortable was we had, been open maybe two or three weeks in the food truck and we were kind of like still getting our footing and i i felt really confident about the food we were putting out but um still it's like food trucks are still kind of weird in fort worth you know it's not like a austin where whatever so like i'm gonna go to this you know crappy bar and a food truck and eat there that doesn't make any sense and so slowly 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 building and then um we got a review good review from somebody and it was like that next day we opened there was 70 people in line and we were like whoa this is this is crazy and so after about a week then emma was still working her job in a uh, oil and gas and and we finally were like okay i think you can start doing this full time and uh you know it was just the rest is history i guess but it there there's it probably every day moments of, of terror and uh, happiness, you know, especially back then when you're like, uh, you know, it was literally like the conversation of, Hey, if this doesn't work out, we're going to have to move in with your parents. Like you, you understand, like, <laughs> <laughs> it's just like we do, we put all of our chips, uh, you know, uh, in as, as much as, uh, as you can. So it was, it was crazy, but it worked out really well. And, and Fort Worth has been huge supporters of us. So now it's, it's fun to open in Dallas and, and try to, you know, um, expand over there. And it's, it's been crazy. The last, last few years have been wild. Well, we've all benefited from that perseverance. I, I know I try to uh, get as much time as I can at some bacon burn ends last week, probably had too many bacon burn ends, but uh, uh, it's definitely worth it. I, I'm curious, you know, you, you mentioned the beginning that, when I asked you what straight up Texas is, you mentioned barbecue being a part of that. And I think Texas is a, a state full of pride and, you know, maybe uh, competitive with other states or, or other regions and, and barbecue oh, yeah. is certainly a, a discussion. I, I'm curious though, if someone were to walk in to one of your, one of your storefronts or they were to, to, you know, have some Heim barbecue, in what ways does Heim barbecue represent Texas and, and what Texas is about? Yeah. Um, you know, great question. I, I think, um, it, it's barbecue is 
you know, I guess I'm like a seventh generation Texan. Um, allegedly, my great great whatever snuck over on a cattle boat from Germany, landed in Galveston, uh, which I don't, you know, I haven't fact checked that, but that's what my dad told me at least. So um, it's 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 like in our bones, you know. There's a lot of German Czech immigrants in, in Central Texas, South Texas. You have influence of of obviously uh mexican americans you know the tejano culture and and that gets you into barbacoa and all that type of stuff so texas is unique i think because it's regional compared to kansas city or carolinas or that but then we have sort of sub regions of sort of east texas style central texas style all this stuff so um for us you know and and for me personally you know, I, I, I care a lot about the history of barbecue, history of Texas barbecue. And so we, you know, we try to take all of those things that I think are foundational to what is Texas barbecue being, um, you know, community focused, being an inclusive, welcoming environment where, you know, I want to walk in the restaurant and I see, you know, every type of person, you know, on every spectrum of whatever, that's hanging out, having a great time, you know, be a place where you can bring a date, you know, but you can also have your kids running around. Everyone's comfortable, you know, it's a whole um, fun thing. And I, I think that's, you know, important to it kind of tied into to the history of Texas barbecue is a, really a communal um, kind of thing. But, you know, for us, from a food standpoint, you know, there's, there's basics. We, we use uh, oak wood, post oak mainly, but a little white oak little pecan um you know it's all wood fires it's just as good as we can possibly make it the the best quality beef and pork and everything else we can buy um so our brisket's very traditional you know it's something that um we we really put a ton of pride into beef ribs you know all that stuff is is very uh, texas but then you know we have some fun with it like you mentioned the bacon burn ins you know, burn in traditionally is, is like a Kansas city type thing, you know, and essentially what they'll do is, is cook a brisket and then the fatty end of the brisket halfway through or something, slice it in half, uh, cube it into little chunks, rub it in sauce and, um, more rub, put that back on and then use kind of the lean in for, for slices. Well, so if you do that in Texas, they'll throw you out of the state, right? Like it's like sacrilege. So um, can't do that. And so my thought was, what if we took a slab of bacon and basically did a uh, Kansas City style, you know, sort of burn end with it. And uh, hands down, it's, you know, our most popular thing that we make. And now it's cool to see like not only other places in the state, but like all over the world are doing some form of a bacon burn in, pork belly burn in. Um, so it's cool. So I, I think I, there's, I, I've talked with a lot of friends, like one of my, my good friends, Wayne Miller, uh, probably wouldn't mind me saying, but you know, he's, it's his family's place and he's been there forever. You know, they, he doesn't have the luxury necessarily of being super creative with all this stuff. You know, somebody comes in and they want the brisket, the beef ribs, the way it is. And so I think what's cool to see, and it's one of the best places in my opinion in the world with, for barbecue. But I think what you see with a lot of the new guys, a lot of the new kind of food truck places is, you know, sort of a, a respect and, you know, let's say a, a reverence, you know, for barbecue and, and those traditions, but then also a little more creativity, a little more freedom to, to try different stuff, do different sausages, do different, you know, uh, kind of menu items and stuff like that. So. I don't know if that answered the question at all, but sorry. Well, you mentioned, you mentioned a couple of times, just, you know, the community aspect of, of barbecue and, and, you know, Fort Worth being really supportive and, you know, I mean, you're pretty outspoken about small business and challenges and all that kind of stuff. So, I mean, what do you think, I mean, what's your sort of philosophy on, on Texas and its relationship with small businesses or, or like the small barbecue joints, right? I mean, like we, we've got the big chains, Rudy's and, you know, those guys, um, they're, they're obviously like the big rock star companies, but like who's out there talking about the smaller, you know, chains and, and, you know, what role do you feel like you, you play in, in, um, promoting them? Yeah. Um, you know, barbecue, like we said, is, um, 
it's it's tribalistic you know it's almost like uh you know if if i were to wear uh you know god forbid a blue jays hat or something you know it's like uh no 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 like rangers are my team you know i'm not it's this is my place that i go to that i care about and love so i think it's interesting with us now because we've gone into you know multiple locations and we're growing and all that um but i think especially I can speak to Fort Worth and, and Dallas is two, two places, but I know Austin is the same uh, way, but um, the great thing about Texas is you have, like we literally had a smoker and opened a food truck and very, very little money. And uh, it clearly no idea what we were doing. Um, so I think it, it's awesome that, that you have these, you know, communities where you can do that, where you can open in a food truck, open in these smaller places. And as long as your food's good. And I, and I think as long as people feel you're genuine and you're really putting in um, a ton of, you know, hard work and, and effort that people are going to support you. And to a lot of people, you know, will kind of dog on the bigger guys, the Rudy's and the places like that. Well, you know, there's, there's a reason that they're open and that they're successful. You know, it's, you know, there's, there's plenty of spring Creek. Uh, you know, I know those guys with spring Creek and, you know, a lot of people are like, Oh, well, you know, it's not Franklin. Well, it's not supposed to be, you know, I mean, there's, that's, what's cool about barbecue is you, you can go to a, a place like, you know, Franklin and Austin and stand in line for five hours and all that. And they're using prime brisket and they're doing all that. And it's awesome. And it's the best thing ever. Well, some people like, uh, you know, I, I got barbecue and I got 15 minutes, you know, so it's like, where can I go that's going to be affordable, that's going to be consistent. And uh, so you have those places like Spring Creek and Rudy's and all that. And uh, for us, that's where we try to balance that line, which is, I, I don't, it's very hard to do, I think, where we want to do craft barbecue and I want to do that level of the guys that I respect, like like Aaron Franklin and others, but I want to serve it to you as quickly as possible and in an environment, you know, where, uh, like we said, with all the other stuff. So I don't know. I, that didn't answer your question either, but Texas is great. You know, I. I mean, I guess to, to build upon it, I mean, you know, like what were the challenges you guys went through last year? What was the hustle and all of that like for you and your wife uh, to have, you know, a, a smaller organization going through a challenge like that? Was it like the community supportive? I mean, was it family? Like, did, you know, uh, how did how yeah. did you as a restaurant owner make it through? Um, I, I still don't know, <laughs> to be honest with you. I think uh, probably a lot of it is... Uh, is luck or, or, uh, you know, I would say Providence, but I think, uh, we, we had a moment where this was early on and I'm not sure maybe March, you know, of 2020, it was like the very start of where we finally were kind of like, this isn't going away. Like this is a pretty serious deal. And I, I want to say it was a Monday cause I know we were closed at, at our river location, but, um, we were all kind of sitting there with our, you know, kind of our leadership team. And it was it, like a nightmare is kind of uh, a polite way to describe it. It was just this feeling of like, we may not have a business in a week, you know, and sort of everything that we've done. And, and, you know, at, at, at this time right now, sitting here, we have over 160 employees that work for us. And uh, that was, um so it was a little bit less because we had an open dallas you know at that point but we're like literally you have you feel a responsibility of i have a hundred families that are relying on this place being open and how are we going to do that and uh how are we going to you know kind of uh make that happen and so it, w it was uh terrifying <laughs> in a lot of ways but you sort of were kind of like our, our philosophy was let's take it day by day and we from the start we're like we're not we're not letting anyone go we're not you know doing a furlough or whatever um we'll just try to to make it work and and the especially that first month we were losing about 20 grand 20 to 25 grand a week just by keeping everyone wow. employed and and having every every 
think like you know nothing, everything's fine you know <laughs> like don't, don't worry and we had switched uh switched to to go and and only and couldn't have any dining room and then one of the biggest things actually was we had that around that time uh just for our like a regular uh weekend of service at our river store i had about twenty thousand dollars worth of meat in our inventory um and so we're like i don't know if we can even be open tomorrow so uh i know jared uh, follows me on twitter and some of my my twitter rantings but i just put a post up like hey i got a ton of meat <laughs> if you guys want to come by it like we'll sell it and so uh i didn't know at the time that that's illegal but uh you know it's kind of like <laughs> ask for forgiveness later um Did you get away with it? It, yeah i mean uh, you know what do i care it's like i'm not just gonna throw this away so um and then it was later where abbott signed a thing where um yeah. you know it, it was okay or whatever but we had people literally I mean, there's a photo that my wife took where there's probably 200 people in line um, that showed up to buy briskets, um, you know, that the, we were just trying to like, we got to do something with this. So it's, there is moments like that where despite the just, you know, despair and, and uncertainty of everything, uh, we were like, people are going to support us. People are going to care. Um, we did a t-shirt that said family sticks together. And the whole idea was people can buy the t-shirt hundred percent of the proceeds went to our staff. Um, and so we sold a billion t-shirts and raised, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars, um, for that. And, and so there was moments like that, that, that were really special and that I think, um, kind of show you like, you know, the Texas spirit and really what that means of like, it wasn't just, uh, because people are dealing with real shit. Like, you know, I don't know if you can cuss on this, sorry, but people are dealing with, you know, real problems besides like, oh, I can't cook barbecue anymore. And so to be able to see, you know, people that were also struggling, but that were still like, I care about this restaurant. I want to support them. I want to support their employees. Um, that was, I mean, it was, it was amazing, really amazing. So. Travis, I'm curious you know, that, that, that's the story you just shared is awesome. And, and, and I think it was, it's been really cool following you on social media and, and just knowing some of the challenges that you guys have had overcome and the way you've spoken up for, uh, for other small businesses, small restaurants, letting people know of, of some of the challenges that come with that. And, and I'm, you know, I know that there's, there's a, and you've already talked about it, how you guys all kind of stick together while, yeah, you do compete with, other uh you know other barbecue joints there there's a, a camaraderie I, is there a, a place maybe not well known throughout the state of texas uh a, a barbecue spot that you're like i want to give these guys some love that, that they really impress you maybe maybe it's in a big city maybe it's not in a big city a hole in the wall maybe not a hole in the wall but just a, a barbecue spot that you found throughout the state that you just really love there's a great that's great uh question and um a, a few are coming to mind i mean the first one that i'd say is is riverport barbecue which is in uh jefferson texas in east texas um but uh my friend steven joseph owns it and it's like everything you want in a barbecue place really kind of old school stuff but um small town you know vibes all of that and uh you know, you take a drive out there. It's not really close to anything, but they uh, they do a really good job. He was in the Texas Monthly Top 50 uh, the last time they did it. And so that, you know, kind of tells you the, the quality that he's putting out, even for a small town. But, um, you know, they're great. Um, there's a place, Brett's Barbecue in uh, Rockdale, that it's, it's relatively newer. Um, but he's the same way. He's just a nice guy, and he's really committed to kind of the – all the old school, uh, you know, stuff that, that guys like us care about and respect towards what you're doing. Um, but you know, it's also just a fun place to go and, and hang out. So, um, I'm sure, you know, there's a million others, but yeah. I guess the, the million dollar question here, you are going to enjoy some barbecue, but you're also cooking uh, cooking something up. You're a big Rangers fan. Who is at that table? You got, you got four seats, four Ranger seats, and, and you can occupy the fifth. So you'll be joined by four guests. 
who are the, the Rangers folks uh, who are going to join you for some, some Heim barbecue? You put me on, this is a million dollar question. Uh, I have a question. Do they, are they current Rangers or can I pick uh, former Rangers? Uh, you can do and, and dead or alive too. Current, okay. former, anyone. I got to uh, hands down Nolan Ryan, uh, number one. Uh, got to go with Nolan Ryan. Just swear it gets tough. Uh, two, <laughs> maybe, maybe my favorite. I, I would say. I think I can comfortably say my favorite player growing up, Rusty Greer, uh, number two. Um, Cause you know, he's probably just got some good stories too. Um, sure. Three. Uh, three, who would I go with? Um, probably Pudge. I'd probably say Pudge. Um, he was like right in my sweet spot of, of growing up and, you know, what was it? 96 all-star game, you know, I went to, and, and, you know, I just have fun, fun memories of, uh, of him and just, you know, absolute laser beam for an arm. Um, and he's also in the restaurant industry now, I guess, you know, I think he has a couple of restaurants. So, you know, I don't know, maybe, uh, we could, we could talk shop with that. And then, uh, no offense to any any current players. I think fourth. This may be a wild card, but uh, Ron Washington. I'd probably because <laughs> if we're uh, we're having a party, I feel like you'd probably want Ron there. So that, I think that would be my fourth. <laughs> I'm gonna think about that all day and probably have a different answer tomorrow. But that, <laughs> that might be, yeah. I think I think Ron would bring some great stories as well for sure. That's yeah, a, that's a yeah, baseball yeah, yeah. man. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Ron can provide the entertainment, so. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> uh, we, we really appreciate you joining us. Thanks so much for the time. Be sure to check out Travis's. He's got his own podcast with his wife, Emma, Heim Time, a uh, small business podcast, and definitely go and check out Heim Barbecue. If you have, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, you're missing out. Locations in Fort Worth and then one now near Love Field in Dallas. It is legitimately right across the street from Love Field, and you can't miss it yep. uh, with the signage. Yep. Travis, again, thanks so much for joining us on the Straight Up Texas podcast. Thanks a lot, guys. I, I really appreciate it. And and I was going to note, if you do go to Dallas, there's a good chance you'll see uh, one of three people, um, either Jared, Eric Nadell, or our friend Evan Grant. But like one of the three of you guys is in there almost every day, I think. So <laughs> if you need, if you want an autograph or something, uh, you know, that's the, that's the spot to go to. But yeah, thanks a lot, guys. I really appreciate it. Looking forward to more of the Straight Up Texas podcast, so be on the lookout. We'll talk to you soon. Let's go!